الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الناصح الأمين اللهم صل على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام والسنة All praise and thanks belong to Allah for guiding us to Islam and for guiding us to the Sunnah. حدثني جماعة من الشيوخ بإسناد كل إلى سفيان بن عيينة عن عمر بن دينار عن أبي قابوس مولى عبد الله بن عمر عن عبد الله بن عمر بن عاص رضي الله تعالى عنهما أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم من في السماء وقال العلماء ذلك بأن العلم رحمة نتيجته رحمة في الدنيا وغايته رحمة في الآخرة The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the Shemana's hadith that those who show mercy they will be shown mercy by the most merciful Show mercy and be merciful to those who are in the earth and the one who is above the heavens. He will show you mercy. The ulema, they mention this is because knowledge is mercy. The result of knowledge is mercy here in this world. And the ultimate goal of knowledge is mercy in the hereafter. We continue going over the tremendous work by Imam al Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala. And we have reached the 20th hadith and that is the hadith and Abi Mas'ud Uqba bin Amr Al-Ansari Al-Badri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu قال, he said قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he said إن مما أدرك الناس من كلام النبوة الأولى. He said that verily that which has reached the people from the speech of the first prophecy, or meaning the from the prophetic message of old, from the prophetic message of old or of antiquity. That that which has reached them, that was also contained in the prophecy. Or that was a consistent message conveyed by the prophets from the prophets of old is the statement إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ رَوَاهُ بُخَارِ Is that if you are not ashamed, then do as you wish. If you feel no shame, do as you wish. If you have no shyness, do as you wish. Now, I'm to the end of it. And in many ways, this can be uh, translated in a number of expressions that could be used. However, this hadith is of tremendous importance. And from that which points to the fact that it is tremendously important is that you find that this is a consistent message, a consistent theme. From prophet to prophet, that they taught their people, they taught their nations this concept, and that shyness what is an extremely outstanding and noble characteristic, and hence all of the prophets they taught this to their nations. Naam. Muqala Fadilat al Shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin, Al Abad, Al Badr, Hidullah Ta'ala, he mentions, he says, Al Hadith. يدل على أن الحياة ممدوح. This shows us that shyness is praiseworthy. That shyness is something that is praiseworthy. نعم. And this has to be stressed, especially in our time, where shyness is very rare. It's very rare 
that you'll find individuals who are shy is very rare that shyness is advocated is very rare that shyness is promoted so on and so forth now it's very rare that you will find people being praised for being shy but we live in a time where the opposite is true where individuals they are blamed they are censored they are made fun of for being shy now and this is extremely unfortunate and as they say the signs of the time but it's something that we have to be on our guard as it relates to it and be very vigilant so that we do not fall into this evil trend of having a lack of shyness but that we as Muslims we hold on to our values we hold on to our values we hold on to our creed we hold on to our methodology we hold on to our way uh, and the like and that we are not influenced by an Islamic ideas concepts ideologies so on and so forth the Shaykh says, كما هو في هذه يعني هذه الشريعة فهو في شرائع السابقة. Just like this is in our Sharia, this is in our legislation. Likewise, it was in the previous legislations. لأنه من الأخلاق الكريمة because it is from those noble characteristics, traits, and attributes. التي Tawarafatha, that of which has become wide known, widespread. And Nabuat Hatta in Tahat in a Hadihil Ummah. It was well known, widespread amongst the previous prophets, so much so that until it has reached this Ummah, until it has reached this nation. Naam. Which again points us to the fact and the importance and the significance of shyness. That is very important. And in inshallah ta'ala we'll come to see in more depth and detail why. Well Amr Fihi Lil Ibaha Wat Talab Ida Lam Yakun al Mustahya Minhu Memnua and Shara. And I want you to Pay attention to this concept now because in this hadith there is a command. If you feel no shyness, do as you wish. Now there is an, a, there is a command. So the Shaykh he's explaining and he'll go into more depth and detail as it relates to this particular affair. But he is explaining, he says, Well Amru fihi bil ibaha wa tala either lam yakun mustahi and minhu memnu and shara fa in kana memnu and he says that and the command the command that is contained therein then it could be understood that it is something that it is recommended and something that it is required if يعني, that in which an individual is shy from is not something that is prohibited inside of the legislation However, if it is prohibited inside of the legislation, then this is a warning. This is a warning. Naam. So it is not giving a person a license, but it is warning an individual as relates to embarking upon those things in which are prohibited, those things that are haram. Naam. And bithnilahi ta'ala, we will come to see and understand more in more depth and in more detail. وأن مثل ذلك لا يحصل إلا من من ذهب حياؤه أو قل because embarking upon something that is prohibited it will not take place it will not happen except from an individual who they have no shyness or they have very little shyness نعم that a person embarking upon something that is حرام they will only do that if they have no shyness or if they have very little shyness, very little modesty and shyness. Now, Fakal ibn Rajab, Ibn Rajab, he mentions fi jami' al-ulum al-hikam, he mentions in his tremendous book when he explains uh, these ahadith, Fakaluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna mimma adraka al-nas min kalam al-nabuwati al-ula, that verily that which 
has reached the people from the uh, prophets of old. يعني يشير إلى هذا المأمور عن الأنبياء المتقدمين. It is an indication to us that this is an affair that was this was a command. Now that exists amongst the prophets of old, that they used to command their people with this, نعم, to be shy, to have shyness, and that warning them that the only people who do whatever it is they want to do, whether يعني, that thing is prohibited or not, are only those who are devoid of shyness. And that the, and that the people, تدعوالو, يعني, and that this statement became well known amongst the people. And they transmitted it on them in a manner that is mutawatir, in a manner that is well known. It became widespread and well known, this statement and this teaching from the Prophets, alayhum salatu wa salam, qarun and ba'da qarun, from century to century, from generation to generation. They passed this down and they handed down this, um, this, this, this guidance. نعم وهذا يدل على أن النبوة المتقدمة جاءت بهذا الكلام and this is an indication that the prophets of old they came with this speech they came with this exact same speech وأنه اشتهر بين الناس حتى وصل إلى أول هذه الأمة and it became widespread amongst the people until it reached this nation it became widespread amongst the people until it reached this nation. Naam. Walillah alhamd. Walillah am qal until he said, wa qawluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha lam tastahi fasna' ma shit until the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, and if you feel no shyness, then do as you wish. Naam. If you feel no shyness, do as you wish. Ma'na, the meaning of it, qawlan, then there are two understandings of what this means now because a person he may falsely interpret or she may falsely interpret that this is saying that if they are not shy about something then it is okay for them to do it and that the frame of reference by way in which will prevent them or give them license to do it will be based upon their feeling of shyness now so it'll be relative to them if they feel shy then they don't do it but if they don't feel shy then it's okay now, so is that the meaning of it? No, we're going to come to see. The Shaykh, he mentions, he says that the meaning of it is seen from two, yani two different opinions as relates to what is the meaning of this particular statement. Now, the first of them is that He said, firstly, is that it is not a command no license for an individual to just do what they want. It is not a command, nor a license for an individual to do what they want. And this is a, a very important point. Now, it's a very important point. So in our notes, right, it is important to highlight that one, this hadith, it is not a license for an individual to just do what they want. Now, it is not a license for an individual to do what they want. So a person can't come and say, well, I'm okay with it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Either lam testahi ma shit. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you don't have no shyness, do as you wish. I don't, I, don't, I don't care. It's okay with me, so I can do it. The Prophet ﷺ said, I can do it. No, first we understand that this hadith is not a license for an individual to do what they want. Naam. And... It is incumbent that we stress this to our children because unfortunately uh, a lot of the Muslim youth, like the youth in general, now, they become influenced by popular culture, they become influenced by music, by songs, by yeah, so on and so forth. And as we know, uh, the songs and this music and all this is this is from this is the shape this is from Shaytan. Now they call music the Quran of Shaytan. Okay? And from these concepts in which they spread is that do what you like. Do whatever it is you want. Right? And they try to wrap that up and they try to beautify it with their slogans, with their statements, yani, uh, with their false concepts of you only live once. What do I mean false concept? That's true. You only live once. Nah, we're not 
Hindus who believe you get reincarnated and keep trying. It doesn't work like that. Right? So now, you only live once. However, as they say, Kalimatul Haq, Yuradu Bihal Baatil, a true statement, but they intend by it falsehood. When they say you only live once, they mean you only live once, so don't hold yourself back. Enjoy life, do whatever it is you want, how you want, when you want, to the degree in which you want, because you only live once. So go for it. Right? Now, as Muslims, we understand that you only live once in the standpoint meaning of this life. You only have one shot of it in the dunya. However, you will die, then you will be resurrected. And that is going to be the true life man, for those who go to the Jannah. Or you will forever be in the hellfire. Now, so it's not like, as they understand, you only live once and you're not going to be held accountable. You're not going to be questioned. No, you're going to be questioned about what you do in this life. And after you die, yes, you will live again. Not in this world, not in this dunya. You know, there's no coming back here. But you'll be resurrected and you will, you will live in the hereafter. Now, you will live in the hereafter. An individual, they will have the, the life of the, the barzakh. Now, so you will be punished in your grave or you will have bliss inside of your grave. So we are held accountable, we are held responsible. These individuals utilize the likes of this to as to perpetuate this concept of doing what you want, when you want, how you want, to whatever degree in which you want, because you're only upon the earth one time. You're only upon the earth one time. Now, so they say, do what you like, do what you want. Right? It's okay. It's all right. It's okay, it's all right. For what? To do what you want, how you want, when you want, to, to, you know, to the end of it. So, this is what they promote. You only live once, just try it. Now, you only live once, just try it. And these are the satanic justifications that these shayateen from the human beings try to give to our children. That's what they offer to our children. Just drink this. You only live once, just try it. Right? Smoke this. You only live once, just try it. To the end of it. And this is because these shayateen from the human beings, they have no shyness. They're not shy in any which way, shape, and form. They don't care. And this is a problem. But as the believer, we are shy. Now, we are shy. So we understand that this hadith is, 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 is commanding us to be shy. And it is not a license for us to do what we want, when we want, how we want, to the end of it. Now, but rather this is an indication, the meaning of it is that it is dispraising having a lack of shyness. It is a dispraise for those who do what they want. And it is a prohibition from doing just anything you want to do. It is a prohibition from doing that. وَيَعْنِي وَأَهْلُ الْهَذِهِ الْمَقَالَ لَهُمْ طَرِيقَانِ And those who have this opinion is because they look at it from two different standpoints. The first of these standpoints is that أَنَّ الْأَمْرِ بِالْمَعْنَى التَّهْدِيد وَالْوَعِيد That the command يعني فصنع ما شئت Do what you want then this is from the standpoint and its meaning, then this is a threat. This is a promising threat that only those who have no shyness do whatever it is they want. So this is a threat that if you find yourself doing what you want, this is an indication that you are devoid of shyness. Now, if you have no shyness, then do, as this, then do whatever it is you want. فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ يُجَازِيكَ عَلَيْهِ Because Allah, He will punish you for doing that. He will punish you for not having shyness. He will punish you for not exhibiting restraint. He will punish you for just doing what you want, how you want, when you want, so on and so forth. كَقَوْلِهِ is, is, is similar to Allah Ta'ala's statement. وَعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ إِنَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ now, do what you want because verily he is all seeing of what you do. Do whatever you want. Now, do what you want because verily he is all seeing of what you do. 
This is a threat. This is a threat. You want to act foolish? Go ahead. He sees what you're doing. He sees that you're acting foolish and he will hold you accountable for it. Now, you want, you want to do that? Go ahead. You're only going to destroy yourself. It's a threat. It's a threat. So it's understood from that standpoint. If you have no shyness, go ahead. Do what you want. You're going to be punished. You have no shyness? Go ahead. You'll see what's going to happen to you. You're going to be punished. Now, so it's a threat. Also, it's like the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَعْبُدُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِ So worship what you want to worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, is this a license for a person to make shirk? Of course not. Of course not. This is not telling you, go ahead and make shirk. Commanding you to make shirk. Ordering you to make shirk. No, it's not telling you that. But it's warning you that, oh, you want to worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Go ahead, do that and see what happens to you. It's a threat. Go ahead, do that. See what happens to you. Right? It's like from a lesser scale. It's like when you tell your child, don't do so-and-so. Right? And then what do you do to threaten them? What do you say to threaten them? Go ahead, do it. See what happens. Now, if your father told you that, do you understand from him? He's giving you permission to go ahead and do it? No, you understand from him the exact opposite. I better not do that. Because he told me. Go ahead, see what happens. And you don't want to see what happens, right? <laughs> so... No, you don't do it because you understand it is a threat. So you have from the ulama those who say that this, this, this hadith is not giving you license to do what you want, how you want, when you want, but it's commanding you to be shy and it's threatening you if you don't be shy. It's threatening you if you don't be shy. Now, as we see here. وَهَذَا يعني, uh, And this a group, a number of scholars, this is the understanding they have for the meaning of this particular hadith. From them, minhum. Abu Abbas uh, Thalab is Abu Abbas Al Abbas Thalab. The second way of looking at it from this standpoint that this is a threat. Yani al tariq al thani annahu amrun bi ma'na al khabar. That this is a command that comes bearing the meaning. Of informing. Now, so let's go back so as to not call confusion and to not mix the issues. The first opinion is that it is a warning. The first opinion is that it is a warning, right? Or I mean, the first way of looking at it from this, this overall opinion that is not giving you license, then this is what a warning that is telling you go ahead, if you do it, you're going to see what's going to happen, right? The second Standpoint and way of looking at it is because it's informing you. It's informing you that only those who have no shyness do whatever it is they want to. Only those who have no shyness do what they want. That makes sense? So the first standpoint, the first angle of looking at it from this opinion is that it's a warning. It's a warning. Go ahead and do it. See what happens to you. Right? But the second angle from this opinion is that it's give is informing you that only those who have no shyness do what they want. Now that only those who have no shyness do what they want. Now so the Sheikh he mentions he says well ma'na the meaning of it and lam yastahi that really the ones who have no shyness they do whatever it is they want to do. Those who have no shyness they do whatever it is they want to do. For in the man because that which will prevent you from doing despicable things, evil things, that it is shyness. That first and foremost, you are shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, you don't want to do this in front of Allah while Allah is looking at you, watching you, listening to you, so on and so forth. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ حَيَاءٍ Whoever has no shyness, then they will embark upon every foul and despicable thing and every type of sin and evil. You'll find them doing it. Naam. Wama yamtaniru min mithrihi man lahu haya and those yani who will prevent themselves from doing the like of this, 
then that then verily that is what shyness now shyness will prevent a person from doing what this uh, uh, person this evil person that has no shyness Yani, uh, what will stop them will be the determining factor between this one and that one is that this one is shy, that one is not shy. This one is shy in front of his Lord and that one is not shy in front of his Lord. This one is shy in front of the people and that one is not shy in front of the people. Now, as you have individuals who they're not shy, period. So they'll do what they do in private or they do it in public. They don't care because they have no shyness. And a shaitan comes to them and he, yani, another one of their slogans, another one of their propaganda in which they use, Shaitan comes to them and say, no, it's okay, you're you keeping it real. You're keeping it real. You're not being a phony. You foul in, you foul in private and you foul in public. You're a good guy because you're keeping it real. You understand? Whereas what is sought after is that we are shy. And being shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just in public, right? Because Allah wa ta'ala sees us whether we are in public or whether we're by ourselves. So being shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that which is sought after. That's the real good guy. That's keeping it real. Because you're keeping it real with yourself by not hurting yourself. You're keeping it real with yourself by not playing yourself. You're keeping it real with yourself by not destroying yourself. Right? So it is of extreme importance that we strive to be of those who really keep it real. And they are those who understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees them in every situation. So therefore, they are shy. They are shy in front of their Lord in every situation. And that one who was foul in public and foul in private, then they are despicable. They are despicable. And they're only keeping it real despicable. And that's it. The Shaykh, he mentions, he says, وَعَلَىٰ حَدْ قَوْلِهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم فِي مَا رُوَانِ He brings an example of يعني, uh, um, a command that indicates what would you say? Command that indicates information, meaning it comes in the form of a command but is actually informing you of something. Right? And that is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Man kathaba aliya fal yatabawa maqadahu min al nar that whoever lies upon me intentionally, then let him take his seat in the fire. Let him prepare to take his seat in the fire. Right? So this is a command for the tabawwa. Yeah? So let him prepare to take his, yani, uh, let him prepare, let him get ready, so on and so forth, to take what? Maqa'adahu min al Take his chair from the fire. Right? The Shaykh he says, فَهَذَا لَفْضُهُ لَفْضُ الْعَمْرُ He said, so the the expression here is that of a command. But the meaning of it is that it is giving us information. It is informing us of this reality. That whoever lies intentionally upon the Prophet وسلم, then a, yani his seat from the fire is prepared for him. That whoever lies upon the Prophet وسلم, intentionally, then his seat in the fire is prepared for him. A seat in the fire is prepared for that liar. Now, for how that ikhtiyar, and that this opinion, that this was the meaning of the, of the, of, of, of the hadith, now, this was the uh, opinion that was taken by Urbay al Qasim bin Salam, rahimahullah ta'ala, wa ibn Qutayba, uh, and also ibn Qutayba, wa Muhammad bin Nasr. Al-Marwazi Wa ghaynihim Naam and other than him from the ulama Rawahu Abu Dawood Anil Imam Ahmad Ma yadullu ala Mithil hadha al-qawl And then it's also been Narrated on Abu Dawood On Imam Ahmad That which is similar In meaning to this particular statement And then The second Meaning of this hadith And the second Yani meaning of or the second opinion as relates to what is the meaning of the statement, either them tastahi fasnaat mashit, if you have no uh, shyness and do as you wish, then verily this is the statement, yani, um, uh, the meaning of, 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 of it, yani, those ulama, they say what it means is, either them tastahi fasnaat mashit, annahu amrun bi fi'li ma sha, ma yasha, ala zahiri lovely. Well, ma'na, إذا كان الذي 
تريد فعله مما لا يستحيا من فعله لا من الله ولا من الناس لكونه من أفعال الطاعات أو من جميل الأخلاق والأداب المستحسنة فاصنع منه حين إذا ما شئت نعم they look at it from a more literal meaning of it نعم and they look at it from a different angle look at it from a different angle and this angle is that they said because since the meaning of the hadith yeah, or since the meaning of this articulation is a command to do what you want upon its appear articulation its appear wording its apparent wording then the meaning therefore is that if you want to do an action from that in which is not a shameful action that a person will not be ashamed to do it not in front of Allah nor in front of the people because this is an action that is from the righteous good deeds or this is a beautiful or it's an action that is yani, beautiful character a beautiful trait you know a beautiful yani, action right or because this is from good manners that yani, good and excellent and outstanding manners and so on and so forth then if what you want to do is from this category of good things of that in which no one is ashamed to do it because it's good it's wholesome right then if that is the case then do as much as you want from the likes of it if that's the case then do as much as you want from the likes of it so this particular the way the ulama who have this opinion look at it is that Examine what it is you're doing and use this as a frame of reference now and I want us to take this into practice ourselves Use this as a frame of reference what you are about to do Is this something and you and you and you question yourself you examine this thing I'm about to do Is it that in which I don't feel any shame to do it in front of Allah? I don't feel any shame to do it in front of the people Why because I'm immoral and have no shame. No, no because this thing is an act of worship, right? It's an act of worship. So you can look at it. This thing that I'm about to do, is it, a, it's a, it, it, is it an act of worship? Or is it something that is a good trait, good character, uh, yani, uh, uh, a sign of good character? Or is this a deed that is praiseworthy? It's a good, wholesome, good deed, naam, so on and so forth, that if this thing fits that category that it is a act of worship or it is a trait of outstanding character right or it is a, a a deed that is wholesome goodly wholesome deed and so on and so forth if it fits the bill then i then, then i can do it as much of it as, as i want right but what's understood is that if it doesn't fit the bill i can't do it can't do it Right? So now I want you to, again, I want you to reflect and think about this. Because a lot of times, you know, our souls call us to do evil. So we try to get around things that we know. Right? So like, 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 like a formation. Someone will come and they will ask you a, a crazy question. Right? Can I do this haram thing? Knowing that it's haram. Right? Knowing that it is, it, it, it is that which is prohibited inside of the deen. But they'll come and ask, do I have license to do this haram thing? Well, if you know this thing is haram, right, and you're not put inside of a situation that is a necessity, you have no choice, a true necessity. Like for the one who's about to die, unless he eats pork, he's going he's gonna to starve to death, so then he has to eat pork, right? That's a, is a true necessity. We're not talking about true necessity. We're not talking about a truly, truly, truly rough and stringent situation. We're talking about something in which a person actually has an option, and hence they're coming to you. My boss offered me this. Should I take it or should I not take it? You don't have to take it, right? Should I take it, should I not take it? But it's something that is haram. It's something that is haram. Clearly haram, right? My boss, he cheats people. My boss cheats people and he swindles them, he cons them, right? And he's telling me that he's going to give me a bonus from this money that he stole from the people. Can I take it? What do you think, <laughs> right? Right? If you, yani, subhanAllah, it has it is, it, it is come from, from, from robbing the people, stealing the people. This is 
money that was stolen, misappropriated, swindled, embezzled. Can I take some of that embezzled money? No, of course not. This is haram. Why are you even asking that question? Because the evil of the soul, they're trying to find an excuse. Right? But the point is, is that if you take the likes of this hadith and you utilize it, this thing that you want to do, is it, is it halal? Is it something that is halal? Is it something that is known to be praiseworthy? Is this something that is known to be good, known to be wholesome? Right? A person will quickly realize, well, embezzlement, nah, it's not known to be wholesome. People go to jail for that. Embezzlement, is that something I want the people to find out? No. Why? The people go to jail for that. Right? Embezzlement. Is this something that the deen yani, supports? Robbing and stealing and cheating people? Of course not. The Prophet said, whoever cheats us is not from us. So cheating is, is, is haram. So then, what happens? The person has the ability to answer their own question. If they just will apply, apply the principles that are contained inside of the, the text. Right? And then, you know, to the end of that. You can utilize that as a frame of reference for other examples in real life situations. So you have from the ulama those who say that this is the, actually the meaning of the, of the hadith. And this is a, and the, the opinion of a number of uh, a group of scholars, yani, من, من from the imams of the deen, من whom Abu Ishaq and uh, uh, Marwazi and uh, Shafi'i and uh, يعني مثله Imam Ahmed. Uh, and then Imam Ahmed is also said had this opinion as well, was also narrated on him. Now, if you look, you realize when you look at both understandings of the hadith that one does not exclude the other. Right? That one does not exclude the other. And the ulama, they mention that in likes of cases like this, where you find a number of meanings for a particular text, but that do not contradict each other, then this is an indication that the text points to all of those meanings. That the text points to all of those meanings. So in summary, it could be said that this hadith means that it is a threat. That if you embark upon doing what is haram, that which you should be shy for, if you do it, then go ahead and do it and see what happens to you. It's a threat. At the same time, it's informing us that only those who have no shyness are the ones who do whatever it is they want. So those people who truly have no shyness, they are the ones who do whatever it is they want, how they want, when they want. Also, it gives us a measuring stick that we are to examine what we are going to do. And if that thing that we're going to do is that which is a righteous good deed or a praiseworthy action, wholesome good action from good manners, good character, so on and so forth, then we can do from it as much as we want. And if it does not fit that description, then it is haram. We are not to do it. Why? Because we are to be shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the hadith that means... All of that, and it points us to all of that. Naam. Wallahu a'la wa a'lam. And then the Shaykh he mentions that shyness is of two types. Shyness is of two types. Naam. The first of the shyness, the Shaykh he mentions, he says, the first type, makana khuluqan, uh, khuluqan, it is that which is a, how do you say? It is, a, it is a, a trait, it is a trait and a characteristic that an individual has. It is a trait. I'm looking for the word here, I'm losing the word. The word is, it is a, um, it is a natural trait of a person, right? Disposition. Right, it is, it is from that person's natural disposition. There's another word though. Uh, the word the, the word in English has escaped me right now. Um, what is about in about? Allah understand. Arabic. 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 Yeah, yeah. Shay tabiri. Natural. Natural is, is from a person's yeah, uh, natural characteristics that what that Allah has given him. 
So it's not something a person chooses to do. They just, they're naturally shy. Right? They're naturally shy. And this is from the, the, the greatest of characteristics, that a person is just, they're naturally shy. Man. So there's certain things that a person just wouldn't do because they, they just you know, Allah Ta'ala has blessed them with that characteristic of natural shyness. They, they just feel shy and ashamed to do it. Man. It's like those individuals who, um, who are not married, right? but they have a fear and they have, it's very uncomfortable and awkward to speak to the opposite sex because they're shy. They're shy. Right? A young man, he's not married. A, a, a woman comes and she speaks to him. He gets very nervous. He gets, he, you know, and it's very awkward for him. Very awkward. He don't really want to talk to her. Why? Because that's just, that's him as an individual. He's very modest. Very modest, right? Uh, and, and then like, you have a lot of characteristics that are like that person. Say, well, go and do it. No, I, just, I can't do that. Say this curse word. Oh, I can't say that. I can't, I just, I can't. I just, you know, I can't, I can't do that. I can't say that. This type this is a type of shyness that Allah Ta'ala He blesses an individual with. And this is from yani, the greatest of akhlaq, this is from the greatest of character. Yani, allati, uh, that Allah Ta'ala He will give to the, the slave. وَيَجْ, uh, uh, and He would yani, put him upon that outstanding character. قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم, And for this the Prophet وسلم, He said الْحَيَاءُ لا يأتي إلا بخير. That um, shyness, it, 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 it never comes except with good. Shyness never comes except with good. That individuals, they are shy. And I'm saying this to say is that, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human beings upon fitrah. And from fitrah is to be shy. And if you realize a lot of little children are like this, then it comes a point, and of course, when they're little, they don't really understand, they, they don't really understand. But when it comes to the point where they understand and they can make a distinction between him and her, you find little boys a lot of times, they want to do little girls, get out of here, they're shy. Little girls, they're shy with little boys, right? And then you find what happens is that this evil society corrupts them. Say, no, no, you shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't be like that. Let her play with you. You shouldn't be like that. Let him play with you. Share your toys. Do this, do that. You shouldn't be like that. Now, uh, the schools, they will teach you this as, as if it is something... That is praiseworthy, right? So you have those 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 courses in school and so on and so forth. When they go over public speaking, right? They go over public speaking, uh, and they will tell you that what when you do public speaking, when you speak publicly, you are to look everyone in their face. You are to make eye contact with everyone in the audience. You are to right when you're when you're speaking to 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 someone, you are to make eye contact with that person, regardless whether it's a man or a woman. They don't care. If you're a boy, make contact with the girl. If you're a girl, make eye contact with the man. So on and so forth. Now, give a nice uh, handshake. So on and so forth. They, they, they try to, they, they, yani, they corrupt you and they rip this out of you. And I, and I want us to pay very close attention to this. Where does this happen? It happens in school. Whose school? Public school. Public school ran by who? By the Kufar. We're not talking public school in Sardinia. We ain't talking public school in Urdun, Jordan. We're not talking public school in... Mr. No, no, we're talking in America and Britain and Canada, so on and so forth. Now, these are the things in which they teach our children. So if you think it was bad, oh, it's bad. It's, 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 it's worse than you can possibly imagine. For those who haven't been in that situation, you just don't know how really bad it is. They fight us at every turn. Every turn is a fight to hold on to your Akita. It's a fight to hold on to your manners. It's a fight to hold on to your mores. It's a fight to hold on to your values. Every single turn. And you got to imagine now, we're putting our children in situations where they have to fight and contend with a teacher who is the authority, who's supposed to be the one who knows better. Right? Because you don't go and learn from someone who you, who you deem is more, is, is, is any more ignorant than you are. No, you go to learn from someone who you, who, you, who you see at least as being in that subject as being you know, superior to you in the knowledge of that particular subject. So now we have our children that have to contend with someone who is an authoritative figure over them. That's one. Then we have our children, the children having to contend with an adult, argue and combat an adult to say to an adult, no, I am not doing that. How hard is that? How many adults can't stand up to adults? 
Now I'm asking a real question. How many adults cave into the pressure? Can't stand up to the adults. How many adults, how many adults, men, how many adult men will say things like, I can't pray vuhur because I'm going to get in trouble by HR. If I pray vuhur, I'm going to get in trouble. They're going to write me up. You an adult, man. You talking about somebody going to write you up if you don't pray vuhur? You know what your Lord going to do to you if you don't pray vuhur? You worried about some human being? You worried about HR? Your boss man come around all of a sudden now, you stop, you stop praying? How, how many times did that, 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 that don't happen? Somebody be praying in the corner sneaking. The boss come in, they stop. They ain't doing like they not doing nothing. Subhanallah. So how many adults can't stand up to adults? But yet, well, yet we expect our children to stand up to adults? We expect our children to, to, to hold their ground? No, they're going to cave in. And this is what happens in most situations. They cave in. Those children who don't cave in, they are exceptional. They are, they're not the rule. That's an exception. They are outstanding youth that don't stand up. But they're very rare. Most of the times, they cave in. Hmm? Are they going to tell you they caved in? No. So, when they have Thanksgiving, lunch, inside of school, to celebrate Thanksgiving, so instead of having a period, instead of having a classroom session, they bring out the food and they eat. Right? So now, when your kid comes home and you ask them, did you eat for the Thanksgiving thing? What are they going to say? They're scared of you, so they're going to say, they're going to tell you no. But what happens? They ate. They ate it down. They didn't eat the ham. But they ate everything else. They had the stuffing. They had the collard green. They had the, right? Candy yam, whatever. You know, these people make turkey. They ate it. Okay, secret Santa. Secret Santa. Everybody exchanging gifts. Right? The kid going to tell you, now nah, they didn't participate. Did they participate? Yep. Yep. Nine times out of ten? Yep. But who wants to be the odd man out? Everybody giving gifts. Say, nah, I'm sorry. Yo, sorry. Mikey. Malish, I got you. I don't practice that. So you ain't getting no gift. They gonna do? They gonna do that? No, they gonna they gonna feel ashamed and say Mikey ain't gonna like me. You know, I might get into a fight. I don't know. Whatever the case is, they gonna feel ashamed. They gonna give him something. It, this happens. But the point is, is that our children shouldn't be put in the likes of those situations. One, because. Who wants to harm someone to that extent? That's, that, that's very harmful. But also, knowing in more depth and more detail is that what? Is that it is going to rip them and shred them from any type of shyness. Because the ultimate shyness is to be shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not to be shy when you come home now and, you, and, you, and now you don't want to admit to your father or to your mother that, that you, you did some haram in school. So you're going to lie about it because you're scared of them. No. We have to instill in our children to be what? To be scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if me as a father tell my child to do something that's haram, they say, I love you, Abby, but taqila. Fear Allah, that's haram. I can't do that. Abby, I love you, but taqila. How are you going to ask me to do something like that? That's fear Allah, that's haram. Right? Ultimately, had to be shy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the, the natural shyness that a person is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is... One type of shyness and it's excellent. So we have to be mindful to not put our children in situations where that natural shyness will be ripped away from them. And then you have the second type of shyness and that is the shyness that a person has to strive to, to get. Now, because you may be an individual who you're not scared of people, whether it's a male or female, young, old, you're not scared of nobody. You'll talk to anybody and tell them what you got to tell them. You don't care. Not that... You're a bad person, but is that you're not you're not you're not naturally uncomfortable. So now, what do you have to do? Do you say, "Well, I'm just gonna go with this"? No, no. It's all a test. It's all a test. So now, what do you have to do? You have to make yourself shy. Right? You have to make yourself shy. So although that woman came to you and she flirted with you, right? The person who's naturally shy, he's not going to know what to say. He's going to be too shy. He's not going to be embarrassed. So he's not going to say anything. But now she come and flirt with you. And you can throw it back and forth with the best of them. 
right? Statement for statement. You can, you can, you can tangle with the best of them. But now you have to make yourself shy. So although you could respond, you don't respond. It wasn't due to inability, but it was due to what? Because you were shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means that we have to constantly put ourselves in a state where we are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we know Allah is watching me, Allah is listening to me, Allah sees me, Allah is going to hold me accountable for what I do, for what I say. Allah is going to hold me accountable. Right? So in that situation, someone come and they say something to you, you know exactly the good response to trump what they said to you. But you know what? You fear Allah, you make yourself so shy. You say, I can't say that. Stop for I'm not going to say that. Right? You look down, you look away. Do you feel uncomfortable were you to look up? No. But you don't look up. You say, I'm not, I got fear Allah. This lady, man, get away from me. I got to fear Allah. And you walk away. Right? You make yourself shy. This is the second type of shyness. The reality of it is, is that the believers or believer, they need both of them. Because there's certain aspects, there's certain qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. There's certain things that everyone has their limit, as they say. There's certain things that naturally you, you're not going to do. In order to do it, you have to encourage yourself and push yourself into doing it. Why? Because you're naturally shy. So all of us are shy naturally in certain things. And then all of us are not shy naturally on certain things. So for those things that we're naturally shy on, we have to make sure that we maintain that and that we reinforce that. And those things in which we don't feel any natural shyness for, we make ourselves shy. We make ourselves shy. We strive to be shy. We make ourselves shy in those situations. Now, and this also is a very important thing, but that requires that we are conscious uh, that our Lord is watching us, that he's looking at us, that he's going to hold us account for what we are doing. Now, and this is how we are able to get this level of shyness. And it is very important. And this is the second type uh, of shyness, yani, in summary, of what the Sheikh he mentions. And then the Sheikh, uh, he mentions some benefits that we gain from this narration. And that is, is that shyness is a characteristic from the noble and outstanding characteristics that all of the prophets and the messengers that the prophets from before, they taught their people and they encouraged their people with. Now, so shyness is so important that all of the prophets and the messengers, they taught this to their people. And also, second is encouraging shyness. Encouraging shyness. Uh, now, and highlighting what? The superiority of shyness. Now, and the third point of benefit that we take away from this hadith, or from the points of benefit yani, that we take, take away from this hadith, is that verily um, the one who is not shy, the one who is devoid of shyness, then they are liable to fall into every evil. The one who is not shy, they will fall into every evil. Now, so on uh, and so forth. And then the Shaykh, Allah Ta'ala, he moves on to get into the, the next hadith, um, which is a hadith that is tremendous, a hadith about believing truly in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and being upright upon the religion which is that which is all linked to our day-to-day -day life, is all linked to our daily uh, lives. But inshallah ta'ala, we will get into that in the next class. فَلَعَلَّنَا نَكْتَفِي بِهَذَا الْقَدَرُ وَصَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَّمْ عَلَى نَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَجَزَاكُمَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا